Okay, Lacey, I'm gonna, I've already let people in and I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, sounds good. The reason I'm on here twice is because my husband's inside watching on a different machine. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> he, he, won't steal the, he won't steal the screen. He's just watching from inside. Thank you all for joining us. We have about one more minute. We're gonna let people continue to filter in and we will get started with our presentation shortly.
Wonderful. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. All righty, we are live and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our virtual speaker series on Ask the Expert. And tonight we have Lacey Petavina. Thank you for joining us tonight with Trees Atlanta. My name is Dana Render and I'm the Director of Education. And our mission with Trees Atlanta is to protect and improve Atlanta's urban forests. And we do that through planting conservation efforts by encouraging biodiversity in green spaces and also educating. Lacey Petavina, who is going to be our speaker tonight, is a fish and wildlife biologist with United States Fish and Wildlife Service. So we want this to be a wonderful interactive opportunity for everyone this evening. We do have a Q&A button if you are joining us on Zoom tonight. You can submit your questions there. We also have a couple of questions that people have submitted ahead of time for the Q&A session. And we will go over those questions at the appointed time for our moderation. If you're joining us either on Facebook or on YouTube, you can type questions in on the chat and we will definitely try to get to those questions as well. Any question that we don't get to, we will forward on to Lacey. So if you would like to have her answer you back directly and we don't have time to answer your question during the live session, please definitely leave your email for us. We also wanna make sure that we can serve you as best as possible. We do a lot of these events virtually and have lots of education opportunities. So we'll be sending a survey at the <clears throat> conclusion of this, of this webinar and it should come to your inbox tomorrow. If you don't mind, fill that out for us so that we can get better and better to serve your needs. And if you're looking for other opportunities to join us with more webinars and more learning opportunities, we have several opportunities for you to log on to learn about elderberry syrup, learning about fruit tree selection with concrete jungle, building community through food. And then also we have a virtual concert coming up at the end of October with the Farmer's Jam. You can also sign up for our newsletter at our website and you can find us on social media. So with that said, I'd like to hand it over to Lacey. Hey everybody, I'm gonna share my screen and get started. Okay, hopefully everybody can see my screen. It says that it's sharing. Um, so thanks to Trees Atlanta and to Dana for the invitation to do this um, program tonight. I, um, oh, let's go back one slide. I didn't mean to advance yet. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm happy that everybody's able to be flexible and make this work virtually. I uh, was um, privileged to get to do this presentation last year in person for Trees Atlanta, and that was a lot of fun. Um, if you saw my presentation last year, then you may be confused about um, who I work for. Uh, I did work for Georgia Department of Natural Resources until very recently, and now I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, both jobs are very related to bat conservation in Georgia, so I'm still very happy to give this talk. So I will jump right in. Um, so in Georgia, we have 16 species of bats, which is a lot more than a lot of people realize. Um, normally, if we were doing this in person, I would have posters that look like this to give to everybody. So I hope that um, if you're interested in, in having one of these posters that we'll be able to cross paths one time soon so that uh, you can have a copy of this. But we have 16 different species of bats in Georgia. Some of them range statewide. Some of them are just in the mountains. Some of them are mostly on the coast. Um, but it's a lot more variety than many people realize that we have. 
And something that a lot of people don't realize is that all of the bat species that we have in Georgia only eat insects, they're insectivores. So there are bats across the world that eat all sorts of things and we'll get into some of that. But as far as Georgia bats go, they're all insectivorous. Um, I'll give a little bit of information on bat classification if you're into taxonomy. Um, bats are in phylum chordata, which means they're with the um, group of animals that have a backbone. We're also in that phylum. They're in subphylum vertebrata, which means that the backbone has vertebrae. Um, they're in class mammalia, just like us. They have hair, they give birth to live young, they nurse their young, and they're in the order Chiroptera. And what's cool about Chiroptera is that in Latin, it translates from Latin to English to mean hand wing. So the literal meaning of Chiroptera is hand wing. Um, and then just a fun fact about bats is that there are greater than 1200 species worldwide. And I think this number is actually more like 14 to 1500 at this point. Um, there's quite a lot of different species of bats across the globe. So this is a figure just to show uh, that chiroptera meaning a little bit further. Um, when you look at the wing of a bat, you can see the bone structure is actually really similar to that of the arm and the hand of a human. Um, they really just have webbed fingers. They have really elongated fingers that are webbed and they can fly. So if you feel like you wanna learn how to fly, just find some webbing. Just kidding, don't do that. Um, right now it's October, so it's the fall. So I'm gonna go through kind of a quick life cycle of a bat. Um, everything that I'm gonna tell you here is general information. Uh, because bats are so diverse, there's uh, some differences from species to species um, and from family to family of bats. They um, all kind of act a little bit differently, but in general, um, we'll go through the life cycle. So at this time of year, it is fall. And that's when bats, at least in Georgia, tend to go into what's called swarming behavior. And so they swarm or breed together outside of areas such as caves. Um, they may do this behavior in other areas besides caves, but they all congregate together. They breed. They um, kind of move about and do weird stuff on the landscape for a couple of weeks to a couple of months as they're getting ready for winter. And they get all their summer energy out in the swarming behavior before they uh, go into the cold temperatures. And then many of our bats in the winter will go into hibernation. All of our bats don't hibernate. Some of them live in warm enough areas of the state that they don't need to hibernate. And some of them will go into temporary bouts of hibernation called torpor. Um, so it's not um, a hard and fast rule that every bat hibernates in a cave, but many of them do. And many of them also hibernate in other places like on the landscape, under leaf litter, inside people's houses, in bridges, in trees. Um, so lots of different places that bats can go to either do temporary or long-term hibernation. In the spring, uh, the bats will give birth to their young. So they breed this time of year, but they actually won't give birth to their pups for probably six to seven months from now. Uh, they have um, a natural history trait called delayed fertilization. So that's a trait that keeps them from becoming pregnant until after they've come out of hibernation. So all winter long, the females will store the sperm and then they become impregnated once they come out of hibernation. And that's because if you went into hibernation as a tiny little animal that was pregnant, you might struggle to have enough food and water and energy and fat stores to rear that, that baby while you're hibernating. So that's something that they have adapted to adjust their schedule with. In the late spring and summer, uh, bats will give birth to their young and then rear their young. And so sometimes the lady bats who have been pregnant forever and ever will go into these colonies together and they're called maternity colonies and they kick all of their guy friends out. They don't want them there while they have these little babies to take care of and they will group together in these maternity colonies. Um, in this picture, you can see um, these are raffinus biggered bats. They're one of our native species in Georgia and there's quite a few of them in there. And they are living inside a hollow tree together. And the mothers are the ones that are more of an orange color and the gray ones are the ones that are the pups. 
Uh, this is a close-up of a raffinus figured bat, that same species that you just saw. They are called figured bats for obvious reasons. Um, so this is just a neat photo that we like to share. But a lot of people don't really know how long bats live. Um, normally, if we were in person, I would shout out to the audience, how long do they live? And people would raise their hand and somebody would say something like one or two years. And then somebody would say something like 100 years just to be silly. Um, but the truth is, is that bats are pretty long lived for animals of their size. And the longest living bat on record in the United States that we're aware of was about 35 years old. Um, so they don't all live quite that long, but they do live a good bit longer than other mammals of their size. Mice and other rodents um, tend to live only a couple of years at most, and they give birth to lots and lots and lots of babies during that time. Bats um, will live to be, you know, 10 to 15, maybe 20 years years old and they only have about one to two young per year. So they're very unique for their size. In general, in Georgia, we've got two kind of big groups of the way that we think about bats. So we have our cave bats, which are the bats that tend to use caves in the wintertime for hibernation. Um, some of our species will also use caves in the summertime. Um, this bat right here is covered in condensation because it's very cold, but uh, the temperature is actually pretty stable where it is. And this condensation will form on the bat and they start to look really frosted and look like they're covered in ice and people sometimes will see these in caves and think that they're dead and that they're covered in fungus but they're not they're actually just covered in condensation and they're going to wake up when it gets warm outside and come out we also have tree bats i'm not sure if my the top of my slide is visible because of the screen sharing, but these are our, uh, these are our tree bats. So when we think of our um, tree bats, we think of bats that are more migratory. So they may go into those more temporary bouts of hibernation known as torpor, and they might do that in wood piles or under leaf litter, or they may literally just migrate to a part of their range that's a bit warmer. Um, so when you're thinking of a migratory bat, they don't migrate as far as a migratory bird would typically, but they can move, you know, multiple states over as they migrate. They don't necessarily stay local. So this is a really cute picture that I like to show. And usually when I show it, I get a big aww from the audience. So I'll just pretend that you guys are saying that at home. Um, so a lot of people don't know very much about bats. I hope that at the end of this presentation, you will have learned some things that will make you have a more positive image of them than you started with if you used to be afraid of them. Um, bats do sometimes have a really bad reputation, but uh, there's a lot of really great uh, resources, or sorry, not resources, um, services, eco services that they provide for us and they're really really cute um, these are not native to Georgia they're not even native to the United States these are a fruit bat species but they're so darn cute that I always like to share it so that I can get everybody in their you know their little warm and fuzzy spot so there are some reasons that people should be wary of bats though. So even if you think bats are really really cool there are some things that you have to know about them. Um, and one of those is that bats do um, carry rabies. They have the ability to carry rabies, but not all bats do. In fact, fewer than 1% of all the bats in the world tend to carry rabies. So it's very rare for a bat to have rabies, but because rabies is such a serious disease, um, it has to be taken very seriously. And only those people who are trained to handle bats and who have been vaccinated against rabies should ever touch them. Um, but it, it is something that people are fearful of and with good reason because you don't want to mess around with with the idea of possibly getting exposed to rabies. Um, another disease that is not as common and most people have never even heard of is called histoplasmosis. Um, this is a fungal infection that can get into your lungs and most people who get histoplasmosis either get it from bat or rodent droppings that have been sitting for a long time and the fungus grows on the droppings and then becomes aerosolized. Um, oftentimes people will get histoplasmosis and never even realize that they've had it. They may develop mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, think that they had a little cough and then later on they may have some kind of scan that shows scarring in their lungs um, but in general histoplasmosis is not fatal it's not serious but it is something to be aware of if you happen to be around large numbers of bats or go in caves for fun um, another thing that people don't like about um, 
bats sometimes is that they can get into your home. So bats in the attic, bats in the belfry, um, that's a real thing. People really do get bats in their homes. These are some common places that people do get them. Um, and I think that the option two fell off of this slide, but option one is that if you get bats in your house, you have to call a damage management company. You have to figure out what to do. Uh, people get very scared of how expensive that's going to be. But option two is getting rid of them yourself if you have bats in your house. And I will, um, I can give you guys some information on a website on the Georgia DNR webpage that will um, show you how you can get rid of most bat problems on your own without having to pay anybody to help you. Um, bats are really beneficial, uh, and I think that um, people are becoming more and more aware of that, but there's definitely um, a, a lot of really good services that they provide for us. So bats control insects. They're insect insectivores. They eat 50 to 100 percent of their body weight every night when they eat. Um, and just to put that in perspective, a colony of 100 bats can consume up to 22 pounds of insects in a single night. So they help control our crop pests like beetles and moths and other um, pests that get on all of the food that we like to eat. And everyone always wants to know if bats eat mosquitoes. And yes, they will opportunistically eat mosquitoes. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I get torn up by mosquitoes every single time I walk outside. So I'm very thankful for every single time a bat eats a mosquito. Um, this is kind of an older study now, but um, back in 2011, there was a paper that said that the estimated value of bats to the agricultural industry was almost $23 billion a year. That's a huge amount of money that they save the agricultural industry. And I like to eat food that doesn't taste like pesticides. And I bet you guys probably feel that way too. So eating a healthy food that doesn't have to have as much pesticide sprayed on it, we can thank bats for that. Um, normally, if we were in the room together, I would ask everybody if you've ever seen a big bat emergence like this. Um, and some people would say, yeah, and they get really excited. They've been to Austin, Texas or Carlsbad Caverns. Um, and then some people would be like, wow, I can't believe there's that many bats coming out of that bridge. Um, but there are really, really large colonies of bats that uh, will do really great services for us. This is not in Georgia, um, but we do have some large colonies similar to this. Um, but just to put in perspective what that colony can do, this is a weather map. And as bats are all emerging in this part of Texas from bridges and from caves in the area, they show up on the map and they look a little bit like a storm. Uh, this is um, 20 million bats in this photo. <laughs> and then sometime later, this is what they look like. So every night you have this enormous amount of bats that are emerging from these places where they're roosting and they spread out on the landscape in such great number that they look like a storm on a weather forecast map. And if each one of them is eating 50 to 100% of its body weight, then you can only imagine how many bugs that is, quite a lot. Um, so there's a lot of different types of bats that live all around the world. Um, the ones that we have in Georgia, as I mentioned, they all eat insects, but we have um, fruit eating bats. We have carnivorous bats that will eat frogs and fish. We have um, a few species of vampire bats. Vampire bats are real. There are three species of them. None of them live in Georgia or anywhere close to here. So they're not gonna come to your Halloween party, unfortunately. Um, we have uh, cacti eating bats, um, all different sorts of diets. Um, and most of our bats globally are in decline because of some of many reasons. Um, in Georgia, we have um, some pretty obvious trends of why a lot of our bat species are in decline. And a big one is habitat loss. Again, this is our friend, the raffinous bigger bat with his cute, big fat ears. Um, Raffinous biggered bats live in bottomland hardwood swamps. They prefer tupelo trees and cypress trees. If you've ever been to the Okefenokee Swamp, there's some cool habitat there that looks like this. Um, but about 80% of this habitat that used to be available on the landscape in Georgia has been logged. It's beautiful wood. People like to have furniture made out of it. Um, and as a result, there's been um, a huge loss of habitat to this species. Um, wind energy is a big impact on bats. Um, wind energy is not a huge industry in Georgia yet, um, but it's possible that it'll make it here. There's quite a lot of wind energy in the Great Lakes area, in the mid-Atlantic, in the northeast part of the country, and there's a lot of bats that are being affected by these. And 
the tree bats or the migratory bats that I mentioned earlier in the presentation are the ones that are being hit the hardest by wind energy. And some of the tree bats that we have in the state of Georgia will migrate during times of the year to areas that do have wind energy. So even though we don't have it, they're still being affected by it in other parts of their ranges. There was a paper that came out a couple of years ago with um, a conclusion that over 600,000 bats may have died as a result of wind turbines. And that was in 2013, so seven years ago. So this hasn't gotten better um, as far as its impacts on bats. There are a lot of companies in the wind industry that are trying to work with the conservation community to figure out the time of day, the time of year that the turbines can be turned off or have the speeds lowered so that fewer bats and birds are affected, um, but they are still being affected by it and there are still declines associated with this type of energy. Another big reason that bats are declining in the US, definitely in Georgia um, and across a huge portion of um, the cave and karst region of our country is the um, disease known as white nose syndrome. And this is a photo of bats with white fungus growing around their muzzles, which is where the name comes from. Um, and what is white nose syndrome? White nose syndrome was a fungus, is a fungus that was discovered in the winter of 2006 and 2007. It causes bats to have this fungus grow on their muzzle. It also grows on their wings, their ears, and other parts of their body. It disrupts them in their hibernation and has them waking up and flying in and out of caves in the winter time. And it leads them to eat up all their fat stores. If you guys can hear that squeaking next to me, that's my live bat that I'm gonna show you in a little while. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the Fungus is caught, the disease is caused by a fungus known as Pseudogymnoascus destructans, but since that's a huge mouthful, we call it PD. It's a new fungus to science. It wakes them up from hibernation. It's very much an irritant and it can cause them to become dehydrated and to starve because they've used up all their fat stores. And then it can also cause lesions and generalized infection in the bats that, that contract it. Um, the impacts are really severe. So greater than 90% of bats will die in the first several years of an area becoming infected. Um, this is an old estimate now that 5.7 to 6.7 million bats have died. Um, I think that um, some folks that work more closely with white nose syndrome are working on a, a newer, better estimate uh, to convey how many bats have died by now. Um, and in three years of data from 2012 to 2018, sorry, not three years of data, in six years of data from 2012 to 2018, 95% of our bats in Georgia in the sites that we regularly monitor died. Um, and I don't have the 2019 numbers included in this, um, which would have been the most recent ones. Um, the 2019 to 2020 winter numbers are not included in the slide, but they were about the same. It was about a 95% decline. And there are a number of species that are at risk of extinction or at least extirpation and part of their range as a result of this disease. So what are we doing about it in Georgia to try and fix this? Um, in Georgia, there um, is a lot of effort going into cave surveys. We do swabbing. This picture is of state bat biologist Trina Morris doing a swab of a bat. She's wearing Tyvek and gloves and trying to be really clean taking her samples. So we do um, swab new sites as often as we can to see um, how far it has spread throughout our state. We do winter cave counts to see how the regularly monitored sites are doing from year to year and see how they're declining or not declining. We do summer surveys as well. We weren't able to do any summer surveys this year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, but we do typically do a lot of summer surveys to see how our bats are doing outside of winter. And we work with the Department of Transportation and other partnering agencies to do things like check bridges and culverts before transportation work is done on them to make sure that if bats are using these structures that they're protected before the work begins. Um, and what can you do? Often people see these talks and they get really kind of bummed out because we talk about how badly our bats are declining and they wanna know if there's any way that they can help. And there are some ways. 
you can provide habitat, you can put up a bat house. Um, more and more people are telling us all the time that um, they're putting bat houses up and that it's working, that they're getting bats using them. Even in Atlanta and Metro Atlanta, there are lots of successful bat houses out there. Um, so there's some good information on the Georgia DNR website about the type of bat houses that work the best and um, where you can place them to hopefully get uh, bats using them. Here's just a few criteria for a successful bat house. Um, there's an organization known as BCI or Bat Conservation International, and they approve different bat house plans. Um, they've done a lot of research to see which ones work the best. So if you're gonna put up a bat house, I would recommend making sure that BCI has approved it. Um, you want your bat house to have lots of sun. You want it to be near good habitat, which means uh, possibly near a water source, possibly near some kind of edge habitat, near forested habitat. And you want it to be 15 to 20 feet above the ground if possible so that it has a lower likelihood of bats being predated on and a greater likelihood of bats getting the solar exposure and the warmth that they need. Um, we'll see if this video will work. This is what could happen if you get lucky and you get an occupied bat house. You might get some really cute footage of bats living in your bat house. One of them's going to yawn in just a second. You'll get a bat yawn. <laughs> These are um, Brazilian free-tailed bats, also called Mexican free-tailed bats, in a bat house at uh, Chiha Park in Albany, Georgia, if anyone's familiar with that park. Some other things that you can do if you want to promote having bats um, around your home is to remove invasive plants. So these are some common offenders. And you can plant native plants instead. Um, if you plant natives in your yard on your property, then you promote native insects. And if you promote native insects, then you promote food sources that bats and birds want. Um, so always removing invasives and planting natives can help the bat community. You can provide drinking water sources. So if you have a pond or if you have a bird bath, things like that, um, those water sources are um, good for bats that are nearby that want to take a drink. If you have a swimming pool and you've ever paid attention, you may have seen bats swooping down and drinking water or grabbing bugs that are near the surface of the water. Um, people will get afraid that bats are swooping down at them when they're in their swimming pool at dusk. But in fact, the bats are just swooping down for food and water. They're not trying to scare you. They just Want to, they just want to share the drinking water. If you have edges and linear features or hedgerows, these are good for bats because they can travel alongside them and they have more um, cover and concealment from predators as they move about. And then something else that you can do is you can turn your lights off at night on the outside of your house so that the bats um, aren't deterred from coming close to your space and then also keep your cats inside. I'm a huge animal person. I love my pets, but um, cats are definitely better indoors when it comes to wildlife because they have a huge impact on bats and lots of other species. And then you can educate other people that you know. Um, not everybody will have an opportunity to do a big education event like this one where you're asked to give a presentation, but any any conversation that you have with somebody about bats that you can paint them in a positive light goes a lot further than you realize. Um, so I've told you a lot of information tonight and hopefully I'll answer some good questions for you guys. And then the next time someone in your life has a question or a comment about bats, you can tell them something neat that you learned. You can set them on the right path if they're confused. Um, so education goes a really, really long way when it comes to um, promoting bats in a positive way. And you can provide support. Um, this is a slide that I left in here. Even though I don't work for the Georgia Department of Natural Resources anymore, they are the state wildlife agency that does the majority of the boots on the ground work that promote and support and conserve our native wildlife species. Um, the section that I worked for was called the Wildlife Conservation Section, which primarily works on non-hunted species. Um, a lot of people may already have these Give Wildlife a Chance tags. That's 
a huge way to support that section and specifically these two here, the eagle and the monarch butterfly tag will go directly to support the wildlife conservation section, which is the section that does that conservation work. Um, I have the old photo of the hummingbird tag on here as well. If you have a hummingbird tag, you can continue to keep that tag and pay for that tag annually, but that tag has been retired, so you can't get a new one anymore. And then when you get ready to do your taxes next year, you can do a check off on your tax form to give this um, uh, this this section um, support as well. Um, all of the information that I gave you and so much more is summarized in some way or another on the georgiawildlife.com slash Georgia Bats webpage. There is also an organization in our state that is a uh, volunteer organization known as Georgia Bat Working Group, and their website is gabats.org. So between those two websites, there's quite a bit of information out there for you. And that's all I have for my slides. So I can um, take some questions, but before I take questions, I do have some live bats at my house that I wanted to show you guys. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen and then just go with my face so that everybody can see me a little bit bigger. Um, so last year when I did this program at Trees Atlanta, I was there in person and I had an education bat with me named Commissioner Gordon. And I was able to show him to everyone and he ate for me and everybody got very excited and impressed um, by him. So I have him tonight again and I can show him to you guys. Um, I do want to address um, COVID-19 and bats. Um, there probably have been things that you've heard on the news or read during this pandemic about the relationship between coronaviruses and bats. And it is true that bats potentially are part of the cycle that causes a spillover from animals to humans when it comes to coronavirus. However, um, as far as I know, they have not confirmed for sure that bats were part of this SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. Uh, it's possible, but it hasn't been confirmed. And it definitely did not have anything to do with North American bat populations or the bats that I have here. However, out of an abundance of caution, because this is a virus that um, has even though a small potential, the potential of spilling over back and forth between bats and humans. I'm gonna wear a mask tonight and gloves when I handle these guys, not to protect me, but to protect them. Um, because we do know that this disease is floating around in people. And although I don't think I'm sick, if there's even the smallest chance that I could be, I don't wanna pass it back to these guys. So I'm gonna put a mask on. I won't leave it on the whole time just while I um, handle these guys really quick and let you guys get um, a cute look at them. I have two with me. One's name is Commissioner Gordon and the other one's name is Jingle because he was born at Christmas time. So one sec. So this is Jingle. His name comes from being born at Christmas time, like Jingle all the way. He was born in captivity from another bat that was injured. Um, he is a big brown bat, which is a native species to Georgia. He's a little grouchy, which is why he's smiling like that at the camera. Um, but this is this is Jingle. He's He's really kind of chunky. We call him our butterball. He's a little fat. And he was the one that was over here eating next to me while I was talking, making lots of noise. So this is Jingle. And then I'll show you Commissioner Gordon and I'll see if I can get him to eat a worm. Commissioner Gordon usually eats out of my hand. So let's see if we can get him to do that. This is Commissioner Gordon. He was not born in captivity. He was born in the wild, but he was injured. Let me see if I can find his old injury to show you guys. Oh, kind of hard to tell on camera. 
he has not an entire wing. So can you guys see that? That wing shouldn't look like that. There should be a lot more wing down here. It should look more like this one. He was accidentally slammed in a door at a park. And so he was unable to fly and became a captive bat. So let's see if we can get him to eat on camera. Yay. And what are you feeding him, Lacey? I'm feeding him mealworms. He, um, he's holding it in his mouth. He doesn't want to chew it. He's getting shy, but yeah. So that's Gordon. I'll put him away so he can eat and then I can switch to Q and A. Okay, awesome. We have a lot of great questions coming through. So I'm really excited. <laughs> do you want um, questions? Do you want me to read them through the chat? How do you want to how do you want to handle it? Sure, I, I'll read them for you. And then we also have um, some that were submitted um, a little bit earlier. So okay. I'm gonna kind of combine them because there are a little there are some duplicates. And I'll also try to um, send out questions that are on the same topic. So we have some on bat houses, bat characteristics. So I'll try to keep them all grouped together, guys. So um, can we talk a little bit more about bat houses? Um, sure. How would one determine where to put a bat house in their yard? And yeah. if if they're if the conditions are right for one um, bat box, how successful is the installation in attracting bats? What are the right conditions to make sure it's successful? Yeah, um, so putting a bat house in your yard, um, you want to make sure that you have a lot of solar exposure in the spot that you're going to put one. Um, and one thing that people think that you should do that really isn't very successful is putting them on a tree. So you don't usually want to put a bat house on a tree because it'll get shaded a lot by the branches and um, because a lot of uh, predators could get to it if it's on a tree, snakes and ants and things like that. Um, and you also don't really want to put it on the side of your house. And that's because even if you do get a lot of sun exposure on the side of your house, you don't want the droppings associated with having bats living up against your house if you do get occupancy. Um, so the best thing to do if you have a really sunny yard is to um, see about getting some kind of pole installed. Um, there's different types of telescopic poles that you can buy. Um, there's some that you can get where there's like a hinge on it so that it is like down like this and then it goes up. Oh, that's ink from my glove. That's weird. Um, so that it's kind of like down like this and then goes up when you're ready to actually um, erect the bat house up in the air. Um, but definitely not on a tree or on the side of your house and you want as much sun as possible. Um, if you live in a really, really hot part of the state, like in South Georgia, you still do want a lot of solar exposure, but maybe you don't want to paint it like black because then it gets really, really hot. Um, most of the time we'll say like you want to paint it a dark color and put it in a space that gets a lot of sun and in North Georgia and in the Piedmont of Central Georgia, that's generally true. But in South, South Georgia, maybe like a light gray or something like that is a better paint color if you're in super fierce solar exposure. Um, and the chances of getting bats, it's really kind of a toss up. There's no way to guarantee it. But um, we had a guy that sent us an email um, to DNR when I was still there this summer that put up a bat house like just a couple months ago and he already had a colony in it. Um, so it, it's really, um, there, there's really no way to tell. There's no guarantees. But if you, um, if you, follow the Bat Conservation International recommendations and get a bat house that they either have approved or get plans from them and build your own and then put it in a good spot with a lot of sun, then you're doing everything you can and you just gotta wait and see. And sometimes it can take a couple of years. So don't get discouraged if you don't have them immediately. Um, how many bats will actually live in one bat house? Um, it really depends on the species. So the species in Georgia that use them most frequently are big brown bats, which is what I just showed you guys. Um, evening bats, which are a little bit smaller. 
and free-tailed bats. And free-tailed bats are the ones that I showed the video of. And usually if they move into a bat house, they move in in like pretty big numbers, like dozens or more. Um, but if you have big brown bats or evening bats, you could get a maternity colony in the summer of, you know, several dozen, something like that. Or you could just get one or two. Um, it's really common to get like just a handful that will live in a bat house together. Um, so it really, it just depends. I mean, there's room in a typical bat house for a few hundred. They, I mean, they'll squeeze up in there together. But I think more commonly people tend to get like a handful, a half dozen, a couple dozen, something like that. Awesome. And are um, the bats that you named just now, are those the ones that are typical um, to Georgia? We have a question on what kinds of bats would actually come yeah. to yeah, what I just showed was a big brown bat, and that species is pretty common in Georgia and across this entire range. It, it I, I can't remember exactly how far it goes into the western part of the U.S., but it's got a pretty big range. It's a pretty common species, um, and they are really closely associated with human structures. They end up in bridges. They end up in houses, um, so they'll definitely use a bat box. If you put one up, there's a really good chance that that's one of the species that you would get if you have occupancy. Okay, and let's see, someone asked, um, they said they live in a densely forested neighborhood and they're mesmerized by the solitary bat that they watch each night at dusk. Um, is, this, is it likely that this bat is a boy bat and where would he go in the fall? It's possible. It's hard to know what species it is, but oftentimes the males will be solitary throughout the summer. Um, there's a good chance that it could be a solitary male that didn't have a maternity colony to be a part of. Um, and it really depends on what species it is, where it would go in the fall. Um, pretty much all of them, no matter what species, um, are breeding right now somewhere. They're um, either near a cave or just out on the landscape breeding. Um, so they'll go to wherever it is that they breed. And then if it's a tree species or a migratory species, they may go um, somewhere further south or they may already be there if they think it'll be warm enough for the winter and hole up in some wood piles or leaf litter or something. If you're in a densely forested area, they could be out there. Or um, if it's a different species that uses caves, they could head to North Georgia to go into their cave habitat for the for the winter. It really just depends. But, but yeah, that's good that you knew that um, uh, I'm, solitary bat could be a male. That's a, yeah, that's impressive. That's a good fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And is this information the same for Central South Carolina? We had a question on that. Yeah, the species that we have in uh, Georgia are really similar to what's in North Carolina and South Carolina. Some of our extremely coastal species might differ slightly. Um, I'm not as familiar with exactly what species are there total, but in general, the bat community in Georgia is really similar to both of the Carolinas. Okay. How would a bat find this bat house? They, you know, they look around when they get to an area um, for a place that they want to stay. Um, a lot of uh, searching for a roost happens in spring when a bat is coming out of hibernation. They figure out where they want to spend their late spring and summer. Um, so it could be that they're out on the landscape figuring out where to have their babies. Or it could be uh, that migratory bat that's coming through that just wants to stop over and it's like, oh, hey, what is this? This seems warm. You know, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly how they find them, but um, having it near habitat that they use definitely helps. If someone builds a bat house, how should they clean it? Yeah, so um, cleaning bat houses is tricky and a lot of people have had trouble with that. So what I would recommend is that um, if you mount one that you either use some kind of telescopic pole that's easy to take back down or what I was mentioning is some of the, um, I have all this weird ink on my hand from those gloves, sorry guys, or like it's not ink, it's like pieces of gloves. <laughs> um, they'll, um, the pole will sort of have a hinge where you can like bring it down and then clean out mud dauber nests or whatever and then you know put it back up so um, either of those designs would be a good way if you don't have either of those designs and you already have a bat house I guess the best thing to do would be to very carefully get on a ladder and use a high pressure water hose in the winter time when nothing's living there to clean it out okay um, 
So someone has a bat house, no mm -hmm. one's moved in, what should they do? Well, if your bat house is already in a good spot, as I've described, then maybe you don't need to do anything. Maybe just wait, maybe just hang out and see if anything comes next year. If you've had it there for quite a while and you've still had no luck, you could maybe consider moving it. Um, moving it is probably a lot of work. Um, putting it up in the first place is not, you know, it's not too tar too terribly hard, but it is a chore. Um, so yeah, it just depends on how long it's been there, whether you think it's worth waiting. Um, but if you've got it in a good spot and nobody showed up yet, you just gotta be patient. All right. We also have a lot of young listeners with us today. So that's exciting. Um, we have, how do bats actually fly? <laughs> Um, this is actually, I wish my husband was out here. So fun fact, my husband is also a bat biologist and he's super interested in all of the adaptation type things. Um, and, uh, bats have evolved for flight. They have, they're really, really lightweight. They've got this really crazy, awesome webbing and skin that's between their fingers. Honestly, I don't know a whole lot personally about aerodynamics. I guess I'm an expert, but I'm not an expert in everything about them. Um, but I can uh, get some more information and send it out in the email that I send out with the rest of these answers, because that's a good one. I Honestly, I don't think anybody's ever asked me how they fly, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> okay. Well, why do they sleep during the day? So they're nocturnal. So they like to feed at night. They mostly feed on insects. They use echolocation to find their food. And uh, what's funny is that oftentimes when you find bats during the day, they're not totally asleep. They're kind of alert. You can disturb them pretty easily, but um, yeah, they reserve all their energy during the day because they're a nocturnal species that likes to be out at night. So that's what they do. Awesome. And someone wants to know, what else does Commissioner Gordon eat other than the mealworms that you fed him? Uh, he pretty much only eats mealworms with us. He'll occasionally eat another species of worm that you can get called a superworm. But what big brown bats usually eat in the wild are primarily beetles. They've got really big teeth and strong jaw muscles, and they like to feed on beetles. And the uh, mealworms actually go through a life cycle where the adult is a beetle. And we will try sometimes to feed them beetles, but in captivity, they seem to like the worms better. They don't usually eat the beetles. And so I want to know how many species of bats are, are in Georgia in total? In Georgia, there are 16 species of bats. Okay, awesome. So how many are native and are there any concerns of non-native bats? Um, we actually don't have a lot of issues that I'm aware of where um, non-native bats will move into areas and affect native species. All 16 species that we have are natives. Um, and we probably the biggest issue that you could imagine with uh, native versus non-native might be in the insect community. If you have a lot of in invasive or non-native plants that affect your invasive and non-invasive insect community, that may like trickle down and affect um, bats' dietary preferences. But we don't have any issues with non-native bat species getting here. They're all native. We're all happy they're here. <laughs> what does bat fur feel like? It feels like um, if you've ever held a hamster or a gerbil or any of those small mammals, it's not very coarse, so it's not quite like a ferret or anything like that. It's sort of like soft, but not wiry like your short-haired dog. More like your golden retriever, like the longer, softer dog fur. Feels like that. Let's see, someone asks, should I put food out for the bats? You don't have to put food out for the bats. Um, bats have plenty of stuff to eat outside. Um, you can, um, if this, I'm, I think this question was from one of our younger watchers. Um, if you want, you can talk with your parents about doing some gardening with some native plant species, which will promote the native insect um, communities. But there's lots and lots of stuff out there for them to eat. You don't have to put food out for them. So um, you talked a lot about native plants that were 
really great for bats because they attract native insects. Um, are there any plants that would actually really repel bats? Um, there aren't any that will specifically repel bats, but there are um, that, like some really common problem species that a lot of people have is we have a lot of um, kudzu in Georgia and kudzu bugs kind of outcompete some of the other um, insects that bats prefer. And then there are some uh, non-native plants that people will put out that have like burrs and stuff on them, like really spiky fruit and um, bats can occasionally get tangled up in them. Um, but it's more about the, um, the insect community than anything. The plants themselves don't repel the animals, at least not bats. They repel some animals, but not bats. Okay, getting a couple more questions about bat houses. How high off the ground should the bat house be? Um, 15 feet or higher, um, 12 would probably be about the minimum that you would want to do. You really want to get it high up in the air um, to make sure that it gets a lot of sun and that it's out of the way of predators. Okay. And what are the indicators that you would know they're, they're roosting in your, your actual house, not their yeah. bat house that you put out? <laughs> right. Um, so if there's like one or two bats that occasionally make it into your house, you may not notice at all unless you see them. But if you have a large colony of bats, you're going to hear them. They're going to make a lot of squeaking. I don't know if you guys heard the squeaking that was happening next to me while I was talking, but that was one bat being pretty rowdy. If you have a whole bunch of bats in your house, you're going to hear them. They're going to sound like a, like a little like kind of all the time, wherever they are. Um, and you'll probably find their droppings. If there's a lot of them, you might smell their droppings. Um, and if they're in your attic or your garage or something like that, and they're not directly in the living space, it is a problem. You don't want that, but you have a little bit more time to figure out what to do. If you find a bat in your actual living space, um, that, that can be an issue and you'll want to um, try to safely get it out of the house um, as quickly as possible. And then if you have to evaluate whether or not like you were asleep with it in there with you and then decide if you need to go to the doctor or figure out if you need to, um, you know, um, think about whether you should get rabies shots. Um, but that's, that's pretty rare. Um, what's the risk of histoplasmosis transmission for a bat houses in a yard? For a bat house in the yard, you really don't have to worry about it. Um, there's enough open air in your yard that it's not going to be a concern. Histoplasmosis becomes a concern in a really confined space where the droppings can sit for a really long time. And then if they get like um, kind of aerosolized as you're cleaning or something like that, or if you're in a cave that has a lot of guano that hasn't been disturbed in a while and it doesn't have open air because it's an enclosed space, that's when it's more of a concern. But the guano that builds up at the base of your bat house is fantastic fertilizer and it belongs to you and you should toss some gloves on and put it in your garden and not worry about it at all. Um, and could you say the fungal infection that you we're talking about a little bit earlier, so I want you to repeat that and when yeah. it was first found. Yeah, it's Pseudogymnoascus destructans or PD, which is a lot easier to say. And that is the causative agent of white nose syndrome, which is the disease that kills them. Um, is there any kind of concern or scare for swimming pool contamination when bats are scooping down to drink water? No, there's really, I mean, the only potential exposure concern is if a bat is floating in the water and can't get out and you try to help it, you have to be careful not to come in direct contact with it. You'd always want to put on thick gloves, use something else to scoop them out so that they can't bite you. Um, but as long as a bat can't get its mouth on you to bite you, there's no disease risk with them being near your pool. And other than cats, what are other main predators for bats? Um, snakes will eat bats, um, owls, um, basically anything that will predate on a rodent will also predate on a bat. So your night raptors, um, your um, reptile predators such as snakes, and then of course cats and anything in the um, predator family that would eat a rodent. Okay. And this might be a question that you might follow up again. It's about um, flying. It says, <laughs> I've, heard, <laughs> it's, I've heard that only a few species of bats in the world have enough strength in their legs to be able to take flight from the ground. 
Can any of the bats native in Georgia take flight from the ground? Yeah, so I do know a little bit about this one. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but I do know that it is really difficult for our bats to take flight from a completely flat surface. Um, the bats, I, I can't say exactly what number of species could or couldn't do it. I think it's more on an individual bat level, whether or not they happen to have the strength to do it. Um, but in general, our bats need to get up high before they can take flight. Um, and ours, the native bats in Georgia don't hang upside down with their wings wrapped the way that you typically imagine. So the ones that were on the slide at the beginning, they had their, they were like completely upside down with their wings wrapped around them like a cocoon. Um, that's actually not how the bats that are native to Georgia and the U.S. Um, um, will hang. They do hang upside down, but they hang upside down kind of with their belly up against whatever it is that they're roosting on. So their belly's up against it, their head is face down, and their feet are rotated 180 degrees backwards from how our feet are so that they can grip onto whatever they're gripping on. So their feet act more like a wrist, and that way they're facing downwards. And when they take flight, they can just sort of go whoop and fly. But if they're flat on the ground or flat on water, it's really hard for them to for them to take flight. They need to get out of that situation so they can get some air. Can you clarify on bat consumption? Um, how how much can um, bats consume? There's a question about the slide. Yeah. Oh, they can consume up to 100% of their body weight in a night. So these bats right here that I have, these big brown bats, they tend to weigh 25 grams or so maybe um, at the fattest time of year. And they could eat that same weight in insects every single night. So lots and lots and lots of insects. They also, um, so I didn't mention this, but sometimes I do mention this um, when I talk about the females becoming pregnant. So most bats will only give um, birth to one pup a year, but some of them will give uh, birth to two and some will even go up to four. And when they are pregnant with that many pups, they're like almost twice as heavy as normal and they still fly around. So they're pretty incredible in the amount of weight that they can carry around. I have a big burger for dinner and I have a hard time walking inside. So I give it to them that they can eat that much and still keep flying around. So concerning reptiles feeding on bats, do you recommend a shield on a pole of the bat house to keep a reptile um, predator out? Um, it's, it can't hurt, um, but I, you wouldn't want to put it directly underneath the, like it, right underneath the bat house because you don't want to affect their flight path. You want them to be able to get in and get out really easily. Um, but if you have a lot of snakes on your property, if you think that that's going to be an issue, it doesn't hurt to put a little snake shield on the pole somewhere like you would um, underneath a wood duck box or similar. So we have someone that's a caver. It says, I'm a caver and use the FWS decontamination protocol for WNS after visiting caves. It's my understanding that WNS is already found in most caves in our area. And some folks take a more casual approach to sanitizing gear and clothing used in Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. How careful should we be about WNS decontamination? So uh, yeah, white nose syndrome um, is what this person's talking about when they say WNS. White nose syndrome is very easily carried on caving equipment. And um, I certainly appreciate that you're a caver who is concerned with that. Um, what the Fish and Wildlife Service has promoted most recently is the idea of dedicated gear. Um, so the Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia area known as TAG is assumed to be completely saturated with white nose syndrome fungus, which is PD. Um, the biggest recommendation would be that you never take any of that equipment to an area that has not yet been exposed by white nose syndrome. Even if you've decontaminated it, it's possible that you haven't decontaminated it enough. And then if you take it to a naive area, then you could accidentally be spreading it. Um, it doesn't hurt to clean your gear in between sites because the reason that white nose syndrome is an issue is because it was naive to our cave environments and there's naive stuff happening like that all the time. So even though the tag area is saturated with white nose syndrome, 
it never hurts to clean in between caves if you want to and if you, it makes you feel better to do so because you never know what other kind of fungus or bacteria or whatever that you could be moving from place to place. But you're right that tag is all saturated with it. Um, and the biggest thing to concern yourself with is that if you do decide to cave outside of the tag area, that you wouldn't ever take tag gear into a non, um, non-contaminated area with wino syndrome. And also um, this person is in Northwest Connecticut, what, and they're seeing bats, what, like, what kind are they most likely? In Northwest Connecticut, there could be, there's probably 10 or 12 species that are up there. There's fewer in Connecticut than there are in Georgia. Um, there are big brown bats there, which is what I showed on camera earlier. There are um, a bunch of species in the genus Myotis, which are the um, mouse-like bats. Um, so you could be seeing those. Um, I would recommend seeing if there is a state a uh, website similar to Georgia DNR, Connecticut has some kind of wildlife resource agency as well. And they may have a website that tells you what species are there, but it could be anywhere from, you know, 10 to 12 species or so that are there. And the last question I have um, is, has there been a rise on any type of hunting or attack on bats, ha bat habitat since the rise of COVID? And what can we do to inform our neighbors to help stop the spread of misinformation about bats with our neighbors in social media contacts? I'm not aware of any specific attacks on bats because of COVID, like physical attacks on them. In general, bats tend to live in areas that people don't frequent all that much. And so there's not um, a lot of problem that I know of where people have actually tried to go out and harm them, but there is a lot of misinformation and not as much recently, but I did see quite a lot on social media when this all first began, where people were, you know, putting a lot of um, uh, quick to judge information before anything had been confirmed with whether or not bats had anything to do with COVID. So I would say the best thing that you can do is to just talk with your friends who have a misunderstanding about it. Um, we, we don't have confirmation that bats were the cause of the spillover. Bats do carry a lot of viruses, that is true. There does tend to be a risk there. Um, but as far as our native bats go, there's no connection whatsoever. And even the species of horseshoe bats in um, Asia that could have been um, involved, that hasn't been confirmed either. So just talk to people make them think bats are cool. It's October. Everybody loves Halloween. They have cute little bat Reese's out this year. I don't know if I've ever seen those before. Buy your buddy a Reese's and it, it's got to be the key to their heart. Peanut butter is the key to everyone's heart. Well, that looks like all of our questions for tonight. This has been a wealth of information. Thank you so much, Lacey. No and problem. for everyone, we, will, we have recorded this video. So we'll send it out so you can review it again in case there are some things that you you missed or you want to revisit or there's some other resources that you would like. Yeah, Thank I'm going to so go much. read tonight about why exactly bats fly so I can give the right answer to that next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And if you have any other questions, feel free to send them to us at education at treesatlanta.org and we can fill them out to Lacey or um, Feel free just to give us some kudos for this presentation because it was a lot of fun. So thank you for our bat ambassadors as well, Jingle and Commissioner Gordon. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in and uh, happy October. <laughs> yeah, have a great night, everyone.